I want to jump here out front for everybody. Remember, subscribe to this podcast. That way you can catch up on our next episode and stay informed on all things land. Welcome to episode number 61 for the National Land Realty Podcast, where we discuss all things land. Our goal here is to inform, educate, and entertain those of you who own land or are interested in the buying and selling of land throughout the United States. My name is Mac Christian, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at National Land Realty. I'll be your host for this episode. Florida has seen one of the largest real estate growth spurts in the United States over the past few years. We are here today to talk with Florida managing broker Justice Kester about that market as well as his unique experiences in the Florida land markets. Today, we discuss what it is like to switch careers into land real estate, the overall Florida markets, including commercial markets, and a unique sale involving a green cemetery. Trust me, the story is worth it. All right, everybody, sit back and enjoy. I'm sitting here with Justice Kester, and I have messed up his name like six times in a row, uh, but we're going with this. Uh, Justice, you're with National Land. You work in Fort Myers, Florida. You're a managing broker. That means you are the big boss. Uh, you you work with agents down there, and uh, you're part of our commercial division. You do land, and you do commercial sales. Uh, tell me a little bit about how did you get into land in the first place? It's a unique niche. And, and sort of how did, did you get with National Land Realty? Well, they, they uh, uh, Mike, just kidding, Mac. <laughs> they, they, they go hand in hand. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so myself, I was in the tech sector for 20 years. I served in the Coast Guard, had an electronic technician background, uh, and then kind of transitioned into uh, a technical world uh, where I had everything from owning my own consulting company to, you know, sales engineer, database engineer. So, uh, you know, everything technical you could think of, I, I've done probably at one point in my career. Uh, and in around 20. 20- 10, 2011, I started thinking of ways that I wouldn't have to be what we call the, you know, the golden handcuffs, right? Um, Especially in the tech sector where uh, if something goes down, all hands on deck, no sleep until things get back up and running. So in 2014, uh, I just went out and got my real estate license. You know, it's it's a way to like break those handcuffs free. Uh, dabbled around in residential, um, didn't really love it. Um, and then, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, knew Jason Walters and introduced us. And we then, and, uh, this was about 2017. Uh, by then I got my broker's license. Uh, and so we kind of just developed this partnership from that point. And, you know, truthfully at that point, I didn't know a lot about the land business, uh, but they were, you know, they knew that I was a, a quick learner and a uh, really focused guy. So they brought me on board. And so in 2017, I just started kind of boots on the ground uh, down here in Fort Myers, starting all by myself uh, and just started to develop relationships, started to learn and started to absorb, uh, including using the great network of national land. I mean, uh, we have a lot of great brokers, so they were a lot of guidance along the way uh, to get me started. And, and during that process, uh, you know, I've learned, you know, but as you know, in any industry, you're always learning. <laughs> there, there's always something new to learn. Uh, and in doing that, uh, you know, it's Florida. So you're dealing with, you know, landowners that are fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation. And there's a lot of history there. Uh, and that's really what started to attract me to, you know, doing this land. But again, because it's Florida, sometimes that beautiful land does transition into commercial property. So I found that, you know, kind of keeping, you know, both doors open uh, was a opportunity for me to continue to develop those relationships with the ranchers and the farmers. um, But also those can be future commercial type properties um, because of the expansion in Florida. Yeah. So you mentioned that, that you, you started in residential and that sort of wasn't your bag. And so 
what what kind of what was it that turned you off of residential real estate and what kind of pointed you toward land? And I realized meeting meeting Jason Walter and everything can be persuasive on its own. Um, and we we're talking about the, uh, the the CEO of National Land. He's the the, the founder of this company. Um, so what what kind of pulled you in that direction if it was an unknown to you? The uh, the process that was explained to me versus residential, you know, I mean, you know, not that we don't work nights and that we don't work weekends, but, you know, residential, that's they, they have to they have to to succeed. Um, and there's a lot of difference in, um, you know, like one of the things that I've loved about, you know, going to land is, you know, I take my dog with me when I go and show properties not doing that when I'm doing residential land, you know, uh, our residential properties, uh, not to mention, I don't come out to a property and somebody says, I don't like the drapes. I'm not going to buy this property. Right. So there's less emotional, um, decision-making in the land, <coughs> excuse me, land business than there is residential. Cause you know, again, a lot of the residential might be first time or second time home buyers. Uh, and there's a lot of emotion in that. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but again, dealing with, uh, you know, individuals that are looking at it as an investment or a business opportunity, um, or just dealing with the landowners and, you know, learning the history of the land, uh, you know, makes it extremely unique. Um, like, you know, one of the properties I sold in DeSoto County, Arcadia, um, as we were surveying it, we found the original survey monuments um, back from, yeah, 1870. And next to some like metal poles that had already been rotted and deteriorated. And back then, um, they used to actually, because, you know, obviously they didn't carry around equipment, they cut the heart of a pine um, and use that as the monument. Well, the oils in that keep it from bug free and deteriorating. So looking at it, you couldn't tell if it was 20 years old or 200 years old. So it's a, you know, like seeing that part of history, that same property, one of the neighbors said, Hey, that artesian well, that's up there by the river. My grandpappy used to use that for, um, in the uh, prohibition days, right? You, you don't have that as much in residential. <laughs> yeah. The stories are very cool. And, and th this is a good opportunity for you to shut me down if I'm off base here, but when I, whenever I've described the differences in residential real estate versus sort of land real estate, I, I kind of describe it in terms of velocity and and I sort of relate that back to, you know, to to just living in the country is the velocity of residential tends to be very, very, very fast paced. You're looking for quick sale, quick buy. Um, people are making frantic bids. They, if there's a bidding war, there's multiple bids on it and there's rapid communications and land deals can take six months, nine months. Some of them, I, I've seen some some of the higher value listings that are around the country be up there for five years. And it because because they're very very unique. I, I would hate to have a listing for five years. That would make that would drive me crazy. But that's that's a, a fact in the industry. Um, do you find that it moves that slowly? But I'll, you're also in Florida, and you guys are getting a massive influx of people. So maybe that's not the case in your area. No, I mean you're you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, when I you know in, in contact with a new uh, either landowner, whether as a buyer or seller, I mean that is truly you know kind of one of the explanations that I you know give to them. Say, hey, this is a relationship building, right? This isn't a one and done sale. And you know I explain to them, and which is true, you know we're starting this relationship now. We may not have a transaction for several years, whether we're buying or selling, and that does happen consistently in this industry, even in Florida. You know, yeah. There can be some quick turnover. There can be some, you know, what we call layups, you know, but at the end of the day, it is still uh, land and it still moves slower and the demand isn't as quick as uh, the residential side. Gotcha. So, and, and you have kind of started targeting, you do both, you do land and commercial, which I mean, we just, from, from our perspective, is still just a land acquisition, land purchase, land sale, you know, something along those lines. But you you take into account different things. Like with commercial, there's a lot of things to consider. And and you've started doing a lot of commercial in your area. What kind of, you know, first going into land, and I've got a couple other questions about getting started in this industry, but um, when what kind of pushed you in, in the direction of commercial? Did, you, did it just kind of come up organically or did you target that initially? It really, because I was in Florida, it really came up organically. It really did because, you know, uh, you know, like I referenced earlier on, 
you know, this is farmland today. Um, it's not like some places in the Midwest where it's always going to be farmland. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's, you know, premium, right? There's places in Florida like that too, but not as many as in the Midwest. So, you know, having these relationships and having saying, Hey, well, right now it's ag land. Um, guess what? Let's take it through entitlement. Let's, you know, you know, we can create a future development out of this. And when I saw that opportunity, I knew that, Hey, we can, you know, kind of chase both um, and continue to develop that and continue to grow, you know, the commercial side of it as well. Yeah. And then just to, to clarify, and you can, you can clarify this too, uh, for those listening that are not familiar with entitlement, where you're looking at changing the property type, right? Where you, you go through a process to get it approved to be commercial from ag. Correct. Like, so for example, uh, you know, an ag land, for example, might have, you know, allowed one unit for every 10 acres, right? So if it's a 300 acre property, you know, you're looking at, you know, 30 units that can be on, on that property. Um, taking it through an entitlement, whether you're taking it through the zoning changes um, or, you know, maybe it's, it's within the same class, but you're changing the, the zoning density uh, allows it to have more of those units, which then obviously makes it more valuable because at the end of the day, our, you know, our developers are looking, you know, what's it costing me, you know, per square foot per unit to, to build. <laughs> yeah. And then that's, and from, from, your perspective being able to offer that insight and facilitate the process of entitlement which takes its own lump of time and it's by itself right and and then being able to work with the landowner because what you're essentially doing is by recognizing that it's a, a area that where entitlement is possible that you can get substantially more for the landowner when when you go through that process and you recognize that right uh, oh yeah 100 percent. i mean it's um yeah, I mean, it, it can be double, triple, you know, sometimes even quadruple the amount. <laughs> Which always works out well for the landowner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the questions that I wanted to ask you were about commercial, but I, I did want to jump backwards a little bit. You mentioned jumping into this industry and starting networking. How did you go about that? I mean, this is an industry that's new to you, and it's sort of like in jumping even from, from residential to... to I, I joke about it and call it hillbilly real estate, but it's just like it's come, you know, land real estate is totally different. And and so how did you go about building a network in this area? Uh, it's slow but sure. You know, I mean, uh, sometimes even as simple as, you know, going to some of these smaller towns, you know, local towns going to their coffee shops, you know, meeting the farmers, the ranchers, you know, greeting them, them uh, being part of, you know, uh, cattle associations, citrus associations, um, the um, uh, working on my ALC accredited land consultant through Realtors Lands Institute. Um, so it, there's a lot of organizations out there that are like that, that really help network you and keep you connected, you know, with these individuals and, you know, truly, when you you know start to build a good reputation, um, it, it it just kind of snowballs into that effect where you know this rancher will vouch for you, and you know that that farmer will you know let you know, hey, this guy over here needs this, and it really starts to you know build into a great network. Yeah, I always refer to it as the world of handshakes, where it's like all the things in the world, what somebody says about you down the road means more than everything else. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and I definitely deal with a lot of, you know, I mean, we, we, you know, we live in a digital world, but, you know, I get apologies for people saying, well, I have an AOL account. I'm like, well, I've got ranchers that don't even have a computer. So yeah. <laughs> you're light years ahead of them. Yep. It is very, very common. Um, so you're in Florida. Florida is all over the news lately um, with growth. And the the influx of people that I had, what was it this last year? Three hundred thousand people have moved to Florida or something like that. Yeah, I mean it's twelve uh, over twelve hundred a day is what moves to Florida. Yeah. So, what have you seen as far as changes in the commercial market? Say, and then we'll we'll say from twenty twenty till now. And I I realize we're probably just going through the COVID you know, time period where everything was chaotic, but that sort of restarted a whole different economy than anything we had seen before. What have you seen in terms of changes to where we sit right now from, from we'll go back to 2020? 
Start Battery Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Get up to a $25 gift card after rebate with the purchase of select Superstart batteries. Our professional parts people will test your old battery for free and recommend the right battery for your vehicle. For power, performance, and reliability, choose Superstart batteries only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Um, I mean, you know, definitely, you know, it's Florida. We've seen an increase in com commercial construction, uh, particularly, you know, I mean, retail was increased and then yes, COVID affected it and kind of slowed it down a little bit. Um, but because we have, you know, an increase in uh, the residential market, you know, things like hospitality and healthcare, right? Um, our hotels, resorts, medical facilities, you know, um, with the growing population and influx, uh, you know, of our tourists. Um, you know, with that, you know, uh, developers and and investors are looking, you know, for opportunities uh, in Florida um, because of our, again, our, you know, residential uh, increase. Uh, tw again, tw I'll refer to twelve hundred, you know, people a day move to, you know, Florida. Um, residential increase leads to, you know, commercial real estate growth <laughs> to support the growing population. Do you, so you mentioned, um, you know, the, the population influx and everything is there, is, has there been a changeover in, you know, retail took a hit obviously. And, you know, what have you seen? Like what kind of momentum do you see in the market right now moving forward? Like what, what are people talking about? What are clients moving towards as, as you start working with them more and more? Um, there's, I mean, everybody's looking for, well, not everyone, but you know, like if I had a, um, if I could cookie cutter out entitled properties, uh, multifamily, um, you know, entitled properties, uh, you know, we could, we could stay busy all the time. It, you know, it's finding those opportunities going through those, um, you know, in the market right now, there's still cash buyers out there. They're looking for the opportunities. Um, they're obviously more selective, you know, um, and we're still, uh, you know, more at sellers are starting to budge more. Um, but they're still not all hundred percent realistic about their prices. Cause you know, again, over, you know, COVID and, you know, past that in 2022, you know, prices just went insane, you know, like, uh, even just basic ag land in Florida was, you know, I mean, unless you were in a large, you know, um, over 500 acres, you know, it was still selling for 10,000 an acre and up. <laughs> and which that's is, just ag land. Which is bonkers. I mean, like yes. the, the amount of increases that we saw during COVID were just bonkers. It was, it was, it, it's hard to put it in perspective, the amount of increases we have, but I mean, homeowners know this, the homeowners saw that their homes increased a hundred percent, you know, in two years. I mean, people just don't see that every day. Um, Where leaders go, learning follows. Join an exceptional peer group to sharpen your leadership skills at Harvard Business School Executive Education. Both in-person and virtual options are available. To apply, visit hbs.me slash go. So with sellers in the market right now, I, I've sort of been referring to it as, and I, and I say me, because not because I want to sound like the smartest person in the room, but because I want to put the liability on my shoulders, like I'm not speaking for the company. <laughs> and so it's sort of like just my assessment of it is, is it seems like we're going to have this period for about the next year where people start to get more realistic with what's happening in the market, where they realize that they're not going to make these massive, massive profits that they thought they were going to, that we reached more of a plateau state, that the price that you're at in three months from now is not going to be this double, triple thing. That it's going to, we're, we're sort of I hit capacity point and we're probably going to stay there for a bit. Maybe move up gently, maybe move down gently, but we're staying in that range. And there's a lot of people still trying to get that extra bit of equity out of the sale. And they're, they're sort of kind of coming back to reality and moving back a little bit. Is that kind of what you're seeing? Yeah. And there's, and, you know, with that, uh, because there was so much activity in the past two years, uh, you know, even in the land business too, you also look at it as, you know, there was a lot of turnover. So for someone to say, Hey, I paid this much for it, you know, call it the peak of the market. 
you know, I, again, I tell people all the time, you know, it's Florida. It's not like in 2006, 2007, 2008, where it was just, it, it became overpriced. Um, the market is still, like you said, I agree. It, it, it might have a little up or a little down, but I don't think it's going to be a lot either way. Yeah. And well, and you spoke to a really good point there. There's a lot of those transactions that happen. You'd call it the peak of what, what we saw in terms of pricing. And, and it was like what midway through last year was probably peak. And there there's those that bought and they don't want to sell and lose. And prices have decreased a little bit. I'm not sure about Florida. That's why I wanted to ask you about Florida is, is we're seeing some decrease depending on where you are. But there's those people that want to make money or not just break even and still make the sale. Yeah. And so to your point, the they're holding longer, right? If they can't get that increase, you know, they're willing to to hold it longer and, and, and not turn over. So which, again, you know, falls to not having as much inventory in the market because people aren't able to, you know, continue to have that same growth spurt that they've seen over the past couple of years to your point of they're not going to double and triple their money. Um, but again, to my point of it's Florida, if you're patient, it's not going to drastically go down. You, you know, we, we are uh, a location that even after hurricanes, even after Hurricane Ian, people still come down here to move. They quickly forget about, you know, things like that because, you know, we have great climate. We're very business friendly. Uh, you know, even the uh, inheritance tax down here. So there's a lot of reasons why people continue to move to Florida. So where do you see it? it it's there's different types of commercial for different situations and you're receiving a huge population influx. Um, are, are you seeing commercial that is getting developed to facilitate for a growing population or are you seeing commercial that is developing because the population is bringing new business with it? Meaning, you know, if there's a population, then you can have commercial developments in multifamily housing, um, those kind of situations, or, are people moving their companies to Florida where you're seeing, you know, headquarters getting built, things like that, or is it all the above? It, it really is all the above. I mean, you, you, you yes, you nailed it. Uh, and, and depending on, you know, the region, you know, um, you know, uh, like, you know, Hertz, uh, in the past five years, you know, moved down to the Bonita Springs area, uh, South of Fort Myers of us, um, you know, Legion Air has a you know big pull to continue to grow the Punta Gorda area. You know, so there are you know Florida again. It incentivizes you know businesses to come down here, um, but at the same token, you've got again twelve hundred people a day moving to Florida. So you you know increase the demand for other commercial type properties. You know, in the you know medical fields, retail space, shopping centers, hotels. You know, uh, it just they all kind of go hand in hand. <laughs> Yeah, well, and then and this is a regional thing, so this isn't going to speak for all of Florida because every every county is different on how they handle their zoning. But are you seeing in your area people building up or out? And and by that meaning, are they are they building dense housing or are they sprawling a little bit and developing sort of that single family home kind of setup? Um, great question. And because I cover a lot of different counties and my agents cover different counties, uh, that also will depend. I would say typically closer to the coast, right? Uh, it's going to be more dense. Um, you're seeing a little bit more spread out communities more in the, you know, uh, 75 runs, you know, kind of North and South along the West coast of Florida and 95 on the East coast of Florida. So I would say, you know, on the West side of 75, as they go further out, they're able to expand a little bit more. Um, uh, and same way with on the East side of 95, you know, they're, they're able to expand a little bit more, but you go East or West of the perspective, you know, 75 or 95, and they don't have many options and it's definitely more dense mixed use type projects. Gotcha. Do you see much resistance with that in, in, in your area? We're so, I mean, it, here in the Northwest, we're seeing issues with, with uh, there's some uh, heavy resistance to we call it up zoning or changing your zoning um, to more dense zoning. Is, is that happening a lot in Florida just based on the, on the rapid growth? Yeah. I mean, cause there's a lot of like hidden gems in Florida. And what I hear is, 
you know, this used to be like Miami or this used to be right. So when we moved here, uh, Jupiter over on the uh, east coast of Florida, right, uh, was kind of a hidden gem. And now it's, again, very expensive to live. Tampa itself is, you know. Uh, even though I reside in Tampa, um, you know, we're experiencing that too. Uh, you know, five years ago, Tampa what wasn't what it is, you know, uh, that it is today and it's continuing to grow. And with that, obviously it comes good and bad. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, you, you can't build up without housing, but you can't have the housing without having the space. And sometimes you have to build up to do that. It's, it's, it, it's sort of a cyclical thing. And then, if you don't upzone, then it makes it makes the value of property higher, and so then you it becomes unaffordable. It's like it's it's this balancing act that, that counties have to play. And you know, I always joke that it depends on how many county commissioners you take out to dinner. Um, it, so. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> depending on the county too, there are definitely some uh, counties that uh, let's say have the more of the good old boy network than others. <laughs> yep, that's it, 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 there's a, there's a lot of they call it the wild west for a reason. There's a lot of the smaller towns out West that are like, it's, you never know <laughs> with yeah. the commissioners on, on how they're going to make the decisions. Um, so what, who do you mostly work with in your area? Like what your, your clientele, are you working with developers? Are you working with land owners on the sale? Sort of how, what's sort of your, your standard, I mean, there's no standard, right? But what yes. what, what sort of is, is like the, the market that you see the most of? Yeah. So I, you know, and I guess that you could kind of break that up into my buyers and sellers, right? Okay. So yeah. for my sellers, yes, I'm working with the landowners, you know, directly. And again, whether they're, you know, a, a, a ranch in the middle of the county that will, you know, always be farmland, um, or I'm working with, you know, uh, a ranch that is, you know, 10 miles along the path of future development that, you know, when they move there four years ago, you know, nothing was near them. Now they're in this future development path and, you know, their property went from ag prices to even if they don't put it in entitlement, you know, to 10 times what ag prices are because of its path in future development. Um, and then as far as like, you know, on the buying side, um, it, it, developers, investors, um, and also, you know, again, uh, people that just want to find land in Florida, you know, it's that that philosophy, which I share and I'm sure you've heard, too, is, you know, you don't wait to buy land, you buy land and wait. I I love that quote. I think so, who was it was guy had Texas just had I think he posted that today. Um, I just saw that. I saw that quote today. Um, so and, and that kind of drives into another question I had in terms of investment in land and investment in commercial real estate. Do you see a lot of transactions from the investment side as in, you know, you've got your, you've got your large scale investors, your single investors, but then you've got your, like your real estate investment trusts that be, invest on behalf of people and make commercial purchases on behalf of people. Are you seeing a lot of that kind of activity in Florida right now? And, and have you facilitated a lot of those? Um, as far as like, uh, whether it's large investors or like fractional ownerships. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so again, I, you know, I really, it, it depends on the area in Florida and I do cover a large area, but also in Florida, there is a lot of diversity. So, you know, we do have that potential um, and I have, you know, worked with, you know, institutional funds, private equity firms, you know, uh, high net worth individuals that are investing directly in, you know, commercial properties in Florida. Um, you know, with things like office building, retail centers, you know, industrial properties, multifamily developments, um, you know, on the other hand, you know, fractional ownership with smaller investors, because, you know, there's a lot of people that retire to Florida, know that it's a, you know, a, a state that has, you know, a pull um, with all, all these opportunities. So, you know, again, that also, you know, is an opportunity for them. Um, but really, you know, ultimately, whether it's, you know, investors or fractional ownership, you know, um, it just depends on the circumstance. But there are both, you know, for someone with whatever their investment goals or or risk appetite in Florida, because we really do have both. What's your favorite type of uh, of land to work with? 
going into more personal questions now. Yeah, no. Uh, I, well, <laughs> I, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I really enjoy when I'm part of a transaction that is just just recreational land and stays recreational land. Um, you know, like I said, I, I bring my dog out on properties with me. So when I'm able to do that, and even though she's getting a little bit older now, um, you know, her running around on the property. And then when I, you know, work with the landowner that has appreciated it for, you know, however many years, and then I am able to match it with a buyer that's going to appreciate it the same way. Um, that's my favorite to do. That's, you know, like it just, it, it, it just fills me up. It makes me, you know, just so satisfied to be in this business to say, Hey, we protected the land, you know, cause we're not going to stop, you know, development. It's, it's a necessary thing, but anytime I can be part of a transaction, um, that preserves the land, even if it's just with the next landowner, um, and not any type of conservation, it, that's where I, you know, really enjoy. You work with a lot of it. When it, when it comes to recreational tracts in your area, is a is it a lot of small acreage or are the do you, are there a lot of those? Because Florida has a lot of those, um, you know, the old school terminology for it is like a plantation sort of style setup. Uh, you know, with large acreage, very luxurious, you know, accommodations there, it, or is it sort of a mixed bag in your area? It is. It can be a mixed bag. So, you know, again, a lot of the large ranches, you know, have a combination because of, you know, Florida's got a lot of wetlands in it. Right. So it, it really can be a mix where they've got, you know, a thousand acres and, you know, 200 of it is, you know, wetland area, which, again, I would call kind of a recreational area can still be a playground for people to appreciate uh, and love. Um, there's a lot of sweet spot between that uh, 20 and 200 acre parcels that people are looking for, for their own kind of personal paradise as well. Gotcha. That's good to know. And that's, you know, it's probably a lot of reason a lot of people moving down there. Um, yeah. what is, what is the most interesting or unique deal that you've ever worked on? Great question. So I would say, um, it, it was a, a 40 acre parcel and it was this, uh, couple that had come to this country um, probably 40 years ago and bought this to farm and they lived on it. They, you know, their whole lives, I had been in contact with them um, actually when I first started in 2017 and stayed in contact with them because they said, well, we may want to sell someday, but you know, uh, if anything ever happens to us, we'll probably even, and they joked about being buried on their own land. And so stayed in contact with them. And I believe it was 2019 where they finally said, Hey, you know what? We need to list it. We, you know, we, we really are serious. We want to move to the city. We love this land, but you know, we're, we're ready to move on. Well, the buyer that I had, uh, acquired and lined up, um, was working on a project that was to build a green cemetery. So beautify the land, a green cemetery, you know, basically they use no embalming fluids, no headstones, and they just, they really truly re-beautify the land. You know, if there's wetlands, they regrow them, things like that. Um, so it turns out that as part of the deal, the owners of this property will be buried on the property that they owned for 40 years. That's kind of fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, and on top of it, um, the the gentleman that bought the property through us is actually one of our agents, Chris Chris Alonzo. Yes, <laughs> I had no idea he did that. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> okay, I that's you you called me on that one. That is an interesting. That's an interesting transaction. Did you have to go through anything? specialized during the transaction phase with you as the agent for a sort of like a, a green style cemetery, or is that more let, let the person who is buying it deal with it? Down yeah, there? that was, I mean, they had some due diligence. So they, um, matter of fact, when Chris first contacted me, um, because I've always been, you know, I ripped the bandaid off. Somebody contacts me on a property. I don't just sell them. I say, well, what are you looking for? Right. Cause I'm not going to sell you on something that doesn't make sense. Um, and you know, some of the things I lead with is, Hey, just to let you know, there's X amount of, you know, wetlands on this property. I want, you know, make sure that you're aware of that. I don't want to lead you to the finish line and then say, Oh, by the way, there's wetlands on the property. 
anyway, so for him, that was a bonus. That was, you know, that worked in his favor. Uh, so they did some due diligence, um, enough for them to feel comfortable and move forward. And then Chris then had to go through, uh, and, and actually to, um, to actually get a cemetery, um, and Chris can go into more detail. Maybe this is a good podcast for you in the future. <laughs> I'm really interested in this one now. I'm going to chase this one down. <laughs> yeah. But it, anyway, so the, the way Chris explained it to me too, is, uh, to go through this process, you basically have to pay for everything and hope that you get approved. So it, it is, it, you know, it's not an easy, you know, win to get into. So yeah, he's gone through a lot to get it to where it's at. Um, he started the project with his mother who unfortunately passed away before they could finish it. Uh, but fortunately she was the first person that was, you know, officially buried at that site. Does Florida have, and this is just a side question on this topic, does Florida have uh, legislation in place where you can be buried on your property? I know that Idaho has that. Is that, is that the case in Florida or do you have to designate it as an actual burial area? You, you do have to designate it and disclose it. Yes. Okay. I was, I've always been curious, but it's one of those things, actually, my, my mom always talks about being buried on our property and it's like kind of a joke in our family. Like, well, there goes the resale value. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a family piece anyways. We're not worried about it, but it's always one of those things like, is that a thing? It is, so yeah, I was just curious about that. Um, what's, what's, what's the most complicated deal that you've worked on? This, this sounds complicated, but I can imagine that it's not with all the 1031s and stuff out there. Like what's the most the nastiest kind of most logistically challenging? I would say, um, so in uh, Northport, Florida, um, I worked with a gentleman that had a 56 acre commercial piece um, that had maybe 2000 foot of road frontage, but then it was like uh, all, uh, like most of the property was in the rear and his density because of North Fort Myers was maybe only 14 units on the whole uh, 56 acres. Right. And there, you know, there wasn't enough commercial uh, available to, to, you know, make that happen. Well, I was able to work with somebody that was doing an RV park that was willing to um, not tie it up based on permits um, and get the negotiation going and do kind of a 90 day close. Thought that's going to be a grand slam. Well, during that process, we discovered things like asbestos pipes were buried in the uh, in the ground. And again, it was one of those where if you know asbestos and they you know are aware of it, if you don't disturb it and it's buried deep enough, you can leave it alone and it's you know it's fine. If not, you have to pay and go through. So there was unknown easements and, and disputes over where the easements were going to be because there were other commercial properties. So, um, you know, again, there were bumps all along the way, uh, dealing with, uh, challenging both seller and buyer at that point that, uh, you know, egos can get involved. Uh, it was the, it, I wasn't a hundred percent confident it was going to close till closing day. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, and we've talked about this kind of stuff a lot and, and it's always a good question to ask like kind of what your most complicated deal is that you've worked on is in these types of situations where there's undisclosed easements, where there's things that are buried, what, what could the seller have done in advance to make the process easier? more due diligence. And, you know, part of that is, you know, as a, a broker, you, you know, as a, as an agent, you, you know, you try to dig up as much yourself. Um, I always encourage, even when I take a listing uh, to, and, and the seller is not always willing to pay it, but, you know, to start doing those title searches right off the bat. So that way, when we get to a closing, you know, if there are any issues or things that come up, we're already, you know, handling those. We're already aware of those versus like, hey, here's the land. Here's what we know about it. Let's put it under contract. Oh, by the way, when we started doing, you know, more due diligence in it, we're finding the dirty laundry. <laughs> Yeah, because no, you get like halfway through it, then you find out like your neighbor has the rights to put a road through it or, you know, something like that, where, the, you know, the, there's there's an easement through through access for a neighbor or like you mentioned commercial um, or things like that, that that can kill a deal real fast. Um, so what sort of, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, you know, 
the prospective Florida market and everything, um, what do you see as the strongest pieces of the market as we move into 2023? I guess as we move into 2024 here in the next few months, which I don't want to admit to because it means time is moving very quickly. Uh, I, I still think um, multifamily um, and uh, you know, still industrial down in, in Florida too. Um, it, it, you know, still a strong market specifically in Charlotte County. Uh, there's a demand for it. Um, so, you know, between those markets, you definitely a lot of opportunities in those. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So again, we're moving on into, uh, into kind of at the end of where I, I requested your time for the day. Um, any kind of like last, last words you want to leave us with as, as we kind of move on? Uh, just that, you know, again, uh, being in the land business really, you know, when I, you know, talked about building relationships, it is a sincerity that I have, um, because they, you know, become friends, family, um, and helping someone along that line, uh, really does give you fulfillment in, in what you're doing. Cause you know, again, you don't see it as a, a job, but more of an opportunity to help someone, educate someone and, you know, bring them to the next level. I mean, I tell everybody I work with, Hey, you got a question about real estate, you know, bring it to me. If I don't know the answer, uh, I'd be glad to get you to the person that will. Excellent. Well, yeah. And you've, you've done a great job with the things that you've worked on. And I'll have all of your information in the notes. Uh, so anybody, anybody moving to the Florida area needs to get a hold of justice here and, and, uh, and give him a chat. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time today, man. Very much appreciated. Uh, I appreciate your experience and your knowledge. Thank you, Matt. This concludes episode number 61 for the National Land Realty Podcast, discussing Florida land markets and unique stories from Florida with Florida managing broker, Justice Kester. You can learn more about the buying and selling of land at nationalland.com. Cool. So I am sitting here with Justice Keister. Ke- Keister. Ke- Keister. Kester. Jesus. See? Should we flag that one? I, I said Keister and it was like, that is not what I meant to say. <laughs> Which I've been called before. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's all right. This is, this is I, I like to screw up a lot to make you comfortable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so no, I, I, I am sitting here with Justice Chester, like Chester, no, like, I know. Uh, Lester. No, Fester. I'm like it's not the name. It's I'm just second guessing it as it comes out of my mouth. I'm just yes. being ridiculous right now. Okay, that's okay. Jesus. All right. <laughs> <laughs>